Welcome to Palmyra Grace Church's Sermon of the Week. At Palmyra Grace Church, our purpose is to help people pursue a life with God together on mission. To that end, our hope is that each Sunday message influences your Monday and every day of the week. For more information about Palmyra Grace Church, follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Or find us at palmyragrace.org. Now here's this week's Sermon of the Week. Goodness gracious. Good morning, and uh, if this is your first time here, um, or you're visiting today uh, because of the dedications, we're in a sermon series called Eight Churches, and um, uh, for those of you that don't know, uh, the Lord has led my family and I to, uh, to a new call, and so uh, in many ways, this is, this is quite honestly our last series together, and um, the Lord, I think, led me to this series because these are uh, letters from Jesus to seven churches in Asia, minor, or in Asia, um, in the book of Revelation, chapters 2 and 3, and I think what he has to say to those churches can be applied to us, and uh, just led me to preach through this section of that book of Revelation uh, as we had our time together. I missed you last week, though. Um, I will be here every week until the end of this series, but I missed you last week. My family, my kids had a fall break, and so we were in Washington, D.C., and uh, I want to thank Dave. I don't see him here yet. Maybe he's online this morning. I want to thank Dave. He did an incredible job, didn't he? And I uh, really enjoyed uh, hearing his message this week, and we're going to lean into the third church today, which is Pergamum. So that's in uh, Revelation chapter 2, if you want to turn there this morning. But before we get into God's Word, uh, let's ask Him to help us. Heavenly Father, we come to You, and we thank You for the time that we were able to worship You through song. And now as we turn to Your Word, Lord, uh, I just ask that uh, You would help us. Holy Spirit, uh, move in our midst. Give ears to each of us to hear what You want us to hear Open our hearts to bring transformation to our lives. Lord, Holy Spirit, speak through me. I cannot do this alone. We know that you have a word for us this morning, and so we give you this time expectant, not that we would learn more, but that you would, through the power of your word and your spirit, you would transform our lives. So we look different tomorrow than we did today that we'd be able to engage our world in the places where we live, work, learn, and play this week with fresh insight, surrendering our lives to you and that you would use us this week to draw others to yourself. Now, Lord, we come to you. Do what only you can do. In Jesus' name, amen. So, the question I have for you this morning is, in your life, have you ever had to compromise have you ever had a compromise? I, I, I know I have. Um, you know, today, actually, today, this day, is my wife and I's, Jessica's, uh, anniversary. We have been married as of today for 18 years. Isn't that awesome? Yeah. And... And the other cool thing is we started dating in October, and so today uh, is, you know, as our anniversary, as we just kind of mark it as a remembering of the first time we, start, we got together as a couple. And so officially now this year, we have been together as long as we lived apart. So 50% of our lives, we have been together, and uh, that makes me feel old, also makes me feel wise, but, it, but it's a great thing. But I can tell you, we would not have made it through those times if we hadn't compromised along the way with one another. Sometimes a compromise can feel like a lose-lose, but in a healthy marriage, often it's a win-win. And, and, it, and it's a necessity as we live in life with each other to sometimes compromise. But compromises aren't always good. I mean, the word compromise itself means, in other places, to lower the standard. And we don't want to necessarily always compromise to lower a standard. Sometimes compromises refer to somebody's actions or behavior where they compromised their life or to, and it ended up ruining their reputation. But compromise is part of life. When it comes to compromise, it's really not a matter of if at some point you're going to make a compromise. It's really a matter of when and what you're going to compromise, yeah? 
And the reason I bring that up this morning is because as we look at these churches, we've been looking at what they're dealing with during this time in the first century when this, this letter to them was written. I said to you the first week that the churches in the province of Asia, these seven churches, they were in a place where they were, extreme, they were facing extreme persecution. And they were, in a, they were at a crossroad moment as a church, whether or not they would compromise their beliefs. And that's especially true of the church we're going to talk about today. And yet Jesus writes to them, and he sends messengers to them, and he says, live faithfully in spite and in light of what you're dealing with. And so we go through each of these letters and we see that they have a pattern that I talked about. Today's is pretty similar to that pattern. Jesus gives them a greeting and then he, then he lets them know what they're doing right and then he kind of gives them a correction and then he gives them, in most of the letters, he says, hear me, listen to me, lean into me. And then he gives them a promise. He gives them a promise about what will happen if they do continue to live in faithfulness. And I've said as we look at these letters, we're going to look at them historically because they were written to real churches in a real place at a real time that were facing real problems. But we're also going to look at them individually and ask the question, what is Jesus revealing about his heart and what he wants for us and how does that apply to my life? But then we're also going to look at it corporately as a church, as Palmyra Grace Church, as the church, the evangelical church in the United States, and what is God in this hour saying through these letters to these churches, to the church? And so if you are with me in scripture this morning, we will be in Revelation chapter two. You can follow along on the screen. You can thumb there or type it into Google or follow along in an app. However you get there, we're gonna be there this morning. Revelation chapter two. 12 to 17. It's amazing what God packs into five verses. And as I was thinking about this this morning, if you're here for the first time, I'm going to tell you, this one's deep. This one's, this one's deep, and uh, so hold on, but I think the Lord is really going to bless us this morning. This, we're in this third, uh, we're, we're looking at this third church this morning. This is the church of Pergamum, or in this map it says Pergamos, which is the, the transliteration of the Greek, and it is the third church, and I shared with you that these letters, John received this revelation from the Lord while he was on the island of Patmos, and then he sent this circular letter around to these churches that are now in modern-day Turkey, and so we looked at Ephesus. Last week, you looked at Smyrna, and today we're in the third one. Now, one scholar tells us about Pergamum, or Pergamos, and what it was like at the time that they received this word from the Lord. He says this, if Ephesus was the New York City of Asia at that time, Pergamum was its Washington, D.C. Now, that's not why we went there last week, just so you know, but, uh, but this, that's what he says. Because, see, there, there was the Roman imperial power, so the governor of Rome had its main seat of government, was in Pergamos. Pergamum was the center point of emperor worship. And I shared with you that in ancient Rome, you, they would worship the emperor as God, as Lord. They also held an altar to Zeus and us inscribed on his altar said, Zeus the Savior, on top of an Acropolis. We'll talk about that in a little bit. And the early Christians living there, when they made a declaration, Jesus is Lord, they were making a strong oath of allegiance to God alone in the face of all of these pagan altars and the emperor cult, which declared and commanded that they say, Caesar is Lord. That's where they're at. That's where this letter was written. And Jesus is writing to this church in the middle of all of that, these words. And to the angel of the church in Pergamum write, the words of him who has the sharp two-edged sword. Now I already told you it was Jesus, but Jesus is letting them know that it is from him. How do we know that? Because Jesus, in his revelation of who he was to John in chapter one, John described him with that same language. He said, in his right hand he held the seven stars, and from his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, and his face was like the sun shining in full strength. You see, in the middle of the times where Jesus was writing to them, there was two groups of people in ancient Rome. There were the Romans who had swords that were the authority 
And then there were those, the Jews and the Christians, who had no authority, and they did not have the swords. And Jesus is saying, that may be your reality, but let me tell you the spiritual reality. I'm the one with the two-edged sword. I'm the one with the authority. I'm the one whose word itself has authority. And I am, another thing for, this, uh, for the sword is, and I am the one who will bring justice and I will judge the earth. And so Jesus is saying, I'm the one who's in charge here through my word and by my authority. And the New Testament picked up on this in other places outside of Revelation that Jesus' words were this t- sharp two-edged sword. They even used this kind of metaphor uh, in the book of Hebrews to talk about the word of God and what it would do. Ephesians 4.12 says, the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword. And why is it sharper than a real sword? Because it pierces to the division of the soul and the spirit, the joints in the, of the marrow, and discerns the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. I don't know about you, but there are times where I read scripture and it reads my heart, and I'm not always happy with what it tells me. It reveals thoughts and intentions. It gets me where it, it, sometimes it calls me to places where I don't want to go and other times it calls me back to places I am that I didn't realize I was, but I'm thankful for that two-edged sword and Jesus is saying, I'm the one who has it and I am calling you to something new, something different, back to where you were and back to chapter two, verse 13, he says, I know where you dwell. In other words, I know what you're dealing with. Where Satan's throne is, yet you hold fast to my name. They were being faithful, even though they dwelled where Satan's throne is. Does that mean there was a legitimate throne to Satan there? No. Now, we're not exactly sure. Scholars aren't. I'm not either. What exactly Jesus was talking about. But I already shared what one scholar said, but let me just break it down a little bit more because this is key to the book of Revelation, but it's also key to this letter. You see, there were authorities in Pergamum that were calling God's people to compromise their faith and give allegiance to them rather than Jesus. So Satan's throne could have been, quite honestly, this throne of Zeus the Savior. You see, because Pergamum was set in an area where they had a necropolis, a natural hill that sat about 300 feet above the city. And on the top of that that acropolis set set Zeus's temple. It was 120 by 112 feet. And in the middle of it, there was a podium 18 feet high where they would worship Zeus as Savior. Like I said, it was also a focus of the imperial cult where they would worship Caesar, the emperor, as Lord. There was also a temple there to the God of healing who was represented by a serpent or a snake. There was also the seat of the Roman government there. So all of these things, all of these symbols of worship and of allegiance were all in Pergamum. And Jesus is saying, I know that you're dealing with it. It is evil. You're in the middle of Satan's throne, and yet you are holding fast. Yet you are not giving your allegiance to something else. He he says this, he goes on, he says, You hold fast to my name, and you did not deny my faith even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness, who was killed among you where Satan wells. Now, who was Antipas? I don't know. We don't know. There's nowhere in scripture that tells us, and, and there's, there's really nothing in history that really lets us know who Antipas was rather than, instead, or other than he was a faithful witness to God under persecution. We do have it, but we, so though we don't know who he is, we have historical examples of what this would look like. Um, one Roman governor who was uh, about the first century, 100, 100 uh, AD, was a governor of Rome. His name was Pliny the Younger. That's a cool name, right? I mean, I just had a birthday a few days ago. I'm thinking as I get older to apply that to the end of my name. Just, I'm now Dan the Younger. Um, and that helps me feel better. But Pliny the Younger, and he talks about what it would look like to be put on trial in a place like Pergamum. See, they would bring Christians to trial before the Roman governor, and they would say, are you a Christian? Do you declare Jesus as Lord? 
And if they said, yes, I do, they would ask them two more times just to make sure because they wanted to make sure they knew if they continued to confess Jesus as Lord and their allegiance only to Jesus, it would mean a sword to the back of the neck. And so they wanted to make sure that they knew what was coming. And so they would say, are you a follower of Jesus? Yes, that meant you were dead and you knew it. Just like Dave showed last week with, with Polycarp, the disciple of John who became bishop, and the way that he confessed Christ as Lord in the middle of the Colosseum. I love that quote that he shared last week. These Christians were facing this as well. And if they said no, because they didn't want to die, what would happen is they would have to recite a prayer uh, Pliny the Younger actually wrote the prayer during his day. They actually had to say a prayer to, Romans God, to the Roman gods, and then they had to offer incense and pour out a, a sacrifice of wine to the altar of Caesar as Lord. They were swearing their allegiance to something other than Jesus. That was a big deal to Christians, and that was what they had to do to keep their lives. Antipas wasn't willing to do something like that. And he died for it. And Jesus is saying, you're holding fast, but, there's always the but, right? Can I say that in church? I just did. But, I have a few things against you, Jesus says. Now here's his correction. You have some there who hold to the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel so that they might eat food sacrificed to idols and practice sexual immorality. So also you have some who hold to the teaching of the Nicolaitans. So Jesus, remember I shared with you the first week that the writers of Revelation and Jesus as he's given this revelation expects that the hearers are going to understand the Old Testament. And so Jesus points to what's happening in Pergamum by using an illustration from the Old Testament, a story found in the book of Numbers, chapters 22 to 25, about a prophet or an oracle named Balaam. And Balaam and Balak, and if you, re- if you don't even recognize those names, maybe you'd recognize this, that it's the story about the talking donkey. And I always appreciate that story because I figure if God can use a talking donkey, then he can use me, Right? And so he says, he he refers back to this, and see what happened at this time was Balak was the king. I wish Balak and Balaam had two different names. It'd be a lot easier for you to follow me, but stick with me, all right? Balak, the king of Moab, got a little intimidated by the Israelites, that they were growing. He was worried about them. And so what he does, he sends some people to this prophet, this oracle Balaam, and he, he wants to pay him to come and curse the Israelites, and so Balaam's like, okay, uh, I'll, I'll come and do this. And there's a lot to that whole story, but for time I'm not going to tell it. But Balaam, at, at the end of the day, he's not able to curse them. He's not able to curse the Israelites. Why? Because Balaam was unable to curse what God already had blessed. Balaam was a, not able to curse what God had already blessed. And so instead of cursing the Israelites like Balak wanted him to, Balaam had an idea. Instead of, since I can't curse them, why don't you entice them to compromise? Why don't you entice them to lose their blessing with the Lord by following in the ways of the Moabites rather than of Yahweh? Why don't you call them from the way of Yahweh to your way? And so they did. And they invited the Israelites to Moabite festivals. And these Moabite festivals were centered around the worship of Moabite gods, not the one true God. And those Moabite festivals involved eating food, sacrificed to the Moabite gods. They involved probably sleeping with, with uh, temple prostitutes. And, they, they, and also, the Moabites paraded their women in front of the Israelite men to entice them to, to, to turn away from their spouses and engage in sexual immorality with the Moabite women. And eventually it turned the Israelites' hearts away from God. God's pointing to this story. Jesus is pointing to this story because the same sort of thing was happening in Pergamum. That's why he mentions the Nicolaitans. If you remember, we, many people think the Nicolaitans were kind of like, hey, listen, you put your faith in Jesus, you got the fire insurance, so now you can live however you want. And not, not that that doesn't happen today, but in Pergamum, 
This is what was happening. There were people in Pergamum, like the Israelites, who got enticed into the ways of the Moabites that were having faith in Jesus, declaring their faith in Jesus, but they weren't aligning their life to his will. They would sing, I surrender all on Sunday morning, but they would surrender none on Monday. Day, on Monday. They were singing that. Jesus, they would say, Jesus, you're the only way to heaven. And yet, he, they would also, by the way that they lived, live in a way that his way was not the only way on earth. There were people in Pergamum that would say, Jesus, you are my savior, but they refused to surrender to him as Lord. It's what Dietrich Bonhoeffer calls cheap grace. You see, what Jesus was saying to the church in Pergamum is, you're compromising, and your compromise compromises you. You're compromising, and your compromise compromises you. Bonhoeffer put, cheap, put it this way in his book, Cost of Discipleship. He said, cheap grace is the preaching of forgiveness without requiring repentance. It's the baptism without the church discipline. It's communion without confession. It's absolution, which means the forgiveness of sins without personal confession. Cheap grace is grace without discipleship, grace without the cross, grace without Jesus Christ living and incarnate. He goes on to say grace is costly because it calls us to follow. And it's grace because it calls us to follow Jesus Christ. It's costly because it costs a man his life. And it's grace because it gives a man only true life. It's costly because it condemns sin, but it's grace because it justifies the sinner. Above all, it's costly because it costs God the life of his son. Jesus is saying, your compromise is compromising you folks Probably because in Pergamum there were people that were eventually turning to eating food sacrificed to idols. They were surrendering because of fear of death, which I don't blame them. Honestly, we've never had to face that. A knife or a sword to the back of the neck to confess Jesus is Lord, and instead they were confessing Jesus, Caesar is Lord, and giving their political allegiance to the emperor. There were people that were probably also giving, uh, worshiping other deities within Pergamum. We know from scholarly work that what also happened in cities like Pergamum is that people were enticed to worship other gods because it meant their economic well-being. You see, in, in ancient Rome, in these cities, they would have what were called trade guilds. And they were basically groups um, this is a crude example because it's not the same, but think like unions or even possibly like the, Mason, the Masons, right? There were groups that w- if you were a tradesman, like a carpenter or a blacksmith, you would have to be part of this guild, this group. And each guild had a deity that they would worship so that it would bless the work of their hands. And so for, to be part of this guild, you would have had to attend these gatherings where the guilds would worship their trade deity and sacrifice to it and then eat the food sacrificed to idols. And if you did not attend what the trade guild was doing, you couldn't practice your trade in the area where the guild was. And so there were people that were, were sacrificing to other gods because it meant literally bread on the table for their families. I've never had to face that, but we think maybe, just maybe, people were compromising because of that. We also believe more than likely there were temple prostitutes when, when the worship of all of these things, and there were probably people that were falling into sexual immorality. They were going along with the prevailing culture's view of sex and sexu- sexuality to get along with the community. And Jesus was calling them out. He was saying to them, there are people that are, putting, that are sacrificing to idols and they are practicing sexual immorality Your compromise is compromising you. And we have the same thing today, right? I mean, we said the first week that these letters are kind of like dashboards to us to kind of reveal what's right and what's wrong in our lives and in our culture and our country today. We have people that confess that they are Christians and yet they're racists. We have people in our culture and our country today who pray to Jesus on Sunday but pray on the poor Monday through Friday. We have people in our culture and in our country today that confess Jesus as Lord, but yet they curse their enemies, especially if they vote differently than they do. 
We have people in our country today that take their talking points from the talking heads rather than taking their talking points from the head of the church, Jesus Christ. We have people in our country today that have surrendered their heart to the Lord, but they've refused to surrender their body, my body, my choice, my sexuality the way I want it. And Jesus would say, your compromise is compromising you. I said we're going deep this morning. Jesus wants us to look at this dashboard and wonder where is it that we are compromising? Where is it that we are surrendering to things other than him? He calls the church of Pergamum to change their direction, to change their mind, to change their life, to repent. He says, therefore repent. If not, I will come to you soon, with, to you soon and war against them with the sword of my mouth. Jesus says, repent from your compromise. I will come and I'm gonna make things right. I'm gonna judge and bring justice and I'm gonna come with a sword. Jesus was clear to them. He said, listen, I understand that the Roman governor and the Roman centurions may be carrying a sword, but I have a two-edged sword and I will cut through half-hearted, divided spirituality. I want all of you. No compromise. But then he gives them a promise. And this is what he says. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will give some of the hidden manna, and I will give him a white stone and a new name written on the stone that no one knows except the one who receives it. Now here, we've got some crazy imagery and metaphor and revelation that makes us scratch our head and stop reading through the book sometimes, right? But once again, Jesus is pointing in the promise back to the Old Testament. And he's saying, you remember when the Israelites were in the Old Testament and I gave them manna every morning? I've given them every single thing that they need. And so you that are facing this persecution, remember he opened the letter saying, I know where you live. I know what you're dealing with. But don't be afraid. Whether it costs you your life or whether it costs you economic hardship, I have hidden manna. I have all that you need. Your Lord will supply all of your needs according to his riches in glory. Glory. There is no need to compromise to receive it elsewhere. That's what Jesus is saying to them. And he's also saying, I will give you a white stone. Now, in Roman Empire in the first century, the white stone meant two things, we know. One of them was when somebody was in, on trial and the jury would come back with a guilty verdict, they would be given a black stone. But if they were given a not guilty verdict, they will be given a white stone. And so Jesus is saying, if you hold true to me, I've already paid the price. I've already bore the guilt. And if you will stay faithful to me, you too will be found not guilty because my blood has covered it all. But not only that, but in this time period, if you were invited to a dinner party, say, your tradesmen were going to worship a deity and have a dinner with food sacrificed to idols, you would receive your invitation on a white stone with your name written on it. And Jesus is saying to them, just like the Moabites enticed them to a banquet, and just like you may be enticed to worship Roman gods to banquets, I'm going to invite you to the banquet the messianic banquet at the end of the age where all who enjoy that supper, the wedding supper of the Lamb, will also receive a brand new name written by me, a new name because you are a new creation in me and you will receive that. There's no need to go anywhere else. My manna and my name that I will give you and the wedding banquet that you will come to will be better than any party that you could compromise your faith to attend. Isn't that cool? Jesus is speaking directly to them, but I think he's speaking to us today because church, I'm just gonna be honest. We need to throw that dashboard up and realize this letter to Pergamum tells us that our compromise compromises us. Your compromise compromises you and the reality of our lives before the Lord as we live out this Christian walk, is that one of two things is gonna happen. Either our life is going to conform to what we believe, or our beliefs are going to conform to what the world says as we live our life. 
There's no either or. This quote, you know, I like A.W. Tozer. I love this quote by A.W. Tozer. He says this, in every field of human endeavor, progress has been made by those who stood up and said, I will not adjust to the world. I will not compromise to the world. The classic composers, poets, architects were people who would not adjust. Today, society insists that if you do not adjust, you will get a complex. You'll be on the wrong side of history. This is where progression is going. Why don't you get on board? They're even going to say, if you don't get adjusted, you're going to have to go to a psychiatrist because you're crazy. You're far off, right? And Batozer says this. He says, Jesus was among the most maladjusted people in his generation. I love that. He, he never pretended to adjust to the world. He came to die for the world and call the world to himself. And the adjustment had to be on the other side. Mic drop. Yeah? Church, our compromise, your compromise and mine, compromises you. I know that we've got to look at it. Are there places where we have given allegiance Are there places where we have been willing to give away what it means to faithfully follow in the way of Jesus? If you're here right now and you're thinking about somebody who needs to hear this message, stop it. He needs us to hear it. He needs you to hear it. Your compromise compromises you. That's a personal thing. Remember, I also said we're going to apply these to the church. Right? And church, I'm going to tell you, our compromise as the church in the United States compromises us. It does. There are churches and there are denominations in our country that have compromised the word of God and the way of Jesus Christ for cultural relevance. And it cannot happen. The denomination that I grew up with has done it and it's become a train wreck. It cannot happen. We have to stand firm on the word regardless of the pressures that we face, believing that God has the the supplies all that we need and that he has a better banquet waiting for us, just like the church in Pergamum. And we must stand on the truth of God's word. I have shared from the moment I came to Palmyra Grace, we will change the methods of how we do church. We can't do church the way we did it in 1900, 1950, 1970, 2000. And I hope that whichever pastor God calls here will change some of the things I did if it makes the church more effective to reach lost people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because I think that we as a church should do anything short of sin to reach the lost with the gospel. But we can never change the message. We can never change the message and we cannot compromise on that. But that's not all. In this part, just hear me, hear my heart. Hear my pastor's heart because nothing has caused me more burden. No, nothing over the last five years has caused me more tears. And this isn't a reflection of you. This is the national situation here with our church in America. Nothing has caused me to pray more than what I'm about to say about our compromise as a church. Friends, unlike Pergamum, we as Americans will not be tempted to compromise and bow our allegiance to an emperor instead of Jesus. We won't. We live in a representative republic. We don't have a dictatorship. So we don't have, it's not a one-to-one comparison, but friends, we must make sure as we engage as citizens who have the ability to exercise our vote in culture in a political process, do not compromise to the place where we give our allegiance to a donkey or an elephant because our allegiance is to a lamb. And we cannot do that. And the world and this country is seeing something different from the church right now. So we need to hold intention, not compromising on the truths of God's word, but also not compromise who the church is and our witness in our country because we pledge allegiance to a party rather than a king. If our mission as the church is to win America more than the hearts of Americans for Jesus Christ, we are off mission. I'm going to say that again because you're too quiet and you should be saying amen. 
If we want to win and save America more than Americans for the, with the gospel of Jesus Christ, the church is off mission. And it compromises who we are. We have a voice, friends. And we should be thankful that we have a voice and we have the freedom to use it. We have the freedom to engage the culture. We have the freedom to engage the political process. But when the church becomes co-opted into the ugliness and the vitriol and the backbiting and the stabbing and the, and the, uh, the slander and, and the, the slide comments and tearing down the opposite side, we compromise the prophetic voice that we have as the church, that we represent the kingdom of God, and we are pointing to a better way. And if we allow our hearts and our lives and our allegiances to be co-opted into that garbage, we've compromised what God has us to do here. It's just the way it is. We compromise our witness we must be wise in the way we engage the cultural wars, not compromising on what we believe, but also not compromising how we engage. Each time we vote, which I hope you all are going to, each time we vote, you must also recognize that you and I are participating in a process that will never produce what it promises. I'll say that again. Each time we vote, we are participating in a process that will never produce what it promises. Because it can't. The only thing that will produce what our political partisanship promises is the coming kingdom of God and its, and its king, our Lord Jesus Christ. That's it. And both parties want the kingdom without the king. And I choose my primary allegiance to be with the Lamb and my primary allegiance to be there alone. So engage it, stand for what we believe in, but let's make sure, let's make sure that the love of the Lord Jesus, which has captured our hearts and saved our souls, is what we lead with as we prophetically speak into our culture. How do we do that? Because you're probably thinking, yeah, but what about this, what about that? I'm not going to have all the answers. It's complicated. But you know what? Jesus said two times in this passage that he has a two-edged sword, which is justice and authority and truth. And the book of Hebrews tells us that the word of God is sharper than a two-edged sword, and it will reveal to us the thoughts and intentions of our heart. God has given us his word, and he has more, even more so given us his Holy Spirit. And friends, as we live faithfully in this hour, the word and the spirit must be how we operate all that we do so that we can be a faithful church in this hour and we can learn from what Jesus has said to Pergamum and we cannot compromise on what we believe, not compromise the mission, but show the world the blessing that comes in living in his kingdom and serving our king first and foremost, yeah? Let's pray.